And um, it was really interesting because uh, back in those days, you know, we didn't wear any clothes. You know, I mean, Did it you was say you went butt ass naked. You might as well say that because well, let me just say this. You, I'm telling you, let, let me explain. You're right. Say it. Say it. I'm explaining. Explain. It was a crazy craze of, of wearing bike shorts yep. and bike and bike uh, bike hats and stuff. The shoes that you were talking about were the wrestling shoes, because as dancers, we a lot of us didn't do this kind of like professionally. So your foot gear was always something that you had to try to find. So. The wrestling gear, at least with that, you had ankle supports because they were kind of tall around the ankle and they were kind of flat. But honestly, it was horrible for your feet because it had no kind of arch in there. Then it was the Chinese slippers because back in those days, and everybody has to remember, 1970, let me explain, 1974, the first martial arts movie that came to America was Five Fingers to Death. And that changed everything. It, it changed everything. All the kids in the hood, once they saw that, everybody was trying to do some sort of martial arts influence in their dance. Whether they took the martial arts, whether they didn't take the martial arts, hell, I was trying to jump off a, off a roof thinking, small roof, thinking that that stuff was real. You know? Come to find out, you know, I, I had a, this little, this little kind of garage thing where I used to live you know, that I would try to jump off of that and try to land and, you know, because I'm looking at the martial arts movies, didn't, not knowing about trampoline and wire work. So all of that kind of transferred <laughs> into into the dance style, you know. Then from there, and as they're saying, because we didn't wear no clothes, back in those days, well, see, I didn't have a membership because back in those days, I was kind of tasty, you know. That was... <laughs> so... When I got to the door, <laughs> no well took one look at me. Please proceed. <laughs> proceed to the door. Proceed. Because I think Oscar, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, when I got there, the membership was I think sixty five dollars. You, know? you got me on the price. I forgot the pricing. I, mean, I, can, I remember sixty-five dollars. What the original pricing was the original first year? Well, you know, they, they um, I got they, after the construction parties. After the construction parties, that's when uh, the membership uh, started coming out. Basically, yeah. Well, what what do you remember? The very yeah. first, the, the the very first membership was free. Brody yeah. Brody used. Um, um, mailing lists from other clubs that he obviously thought would have made good members to the garage. And those very first ones, the ones that I mentioned that had the poem on the back, those mm. were free. Starting in 78, which was when the construction parties were, was when the garage became the Paradise Garage and mm. they had their first memberships. Um, I had signed up and I got the application in the mail. I sent back in the application back to the, the very first application. You could you could do it all by mail and you could select which membership you wanted. I chose the core membership because that's what I wanted to, to do. Speaking of wow. which, after I sent in my application, this is what I got in the mail. Oh, this is the wrench. Oh, my this God. The original, the original wrench. Oh, my God. I've heard so mechanic. much about that. I got a fake. I got <laughs> fake from, from Ministry of Sound. When I went to Ministry Dang. of Sound and uh, what was it? They did a 10th year anniversary in Ministry of Sound. Dang. So they gave so, me so so I got mine a Mine is one. old, it's used and abused because Beautiful. this, this is what I had. What, back is in that real? Mine? Yeah, this this is real. This oh, is a real, real they gave you. Yes. Core wow. mechanic. Okay. Wow. So if memory serves me well, I think the memberships back then were like twenty five dollars for this. Okay, and then you paid you paid eight and ten dollars to get in for each event that you wanted to, you know, for for each party. Then they switched to the cards with the pictures like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was the first year of the card? Was it was it eighty? Um, the, the first year of the card was eighty. 
Okay. Wow. Because they only yeah. get the wrench for the first year. Yeah, because I don't remember that. I don't yeah. remember no, that. I, I don't know anybody the who had for the had first a year. I didn't know anybody who had a wrench. Yeah. No, these, these for real? Me, no, so, I didn't so, so, I knew so, Let me record. tell you a couple of stories about the wrench. Uh oh. Um, need, needless to say, I, I used to walk around with this first on my key ring. Then, <laughs> then I used to oh. walk around with this wrench on my zipper on my fly. <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> because I mean, come on, come on, guys, come on, come on. That's what you know. Late seventies, you, you're into the life. I had I had more than a few people come up, <laughs> grab my wrench, and say to me. Oh man, I'd love to play with your tool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this was this was out on the street. Oh my you god! Know, it was, it was, <laughs> this was out on the street. Oh, so, um, yeah, we had some fun back then. We had ourselves oh my a blast. Going back to the original dance floor, which you know, again, my first time there was summer of '77. I was riding mm-hmm. around with a friend of mine. All I had on was the swimming trunks. And See? we're riding around the city. And I said to my yeah. and, and I said to him, I'd love to go someplace where I could dance just like this. And he said, I got just the place. A new club just <laughs> opened up. New club just opened up in the village. Let's go. We went. And again, walking up that ramp, walking in the dance floor. My mm-hmm. life was never the same after that. I mean, not only did I feel at home, the energy in that place was just unreal. The sexual energy in that place was off the hook. That was crazy. Y'all can talk about mid-80s and on, but late 70s, 77, 78, 79, I mean, Oscar, you you lived through it. It was off the charts. And then Larry... (laughs) <laughs> the beauty with Larry is when 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 Larry was in a good mood and he wanted to take you somewhere, he had you in the palms of his hand. He played music. He took you on a journey. You knew when Larry was feeling good. You <laughs> knew when Larry was not in a good mood. And you oh, knew when oh. Larry just felt like beating you up. But when Larry wanted to take you somewhere the good thing about you know having a residency larry could play whatever he wanted to and when he played i mean he could do whatever he wanted to do to us on that dance floor Uh, you know i've always considered myself someone who as much as i was in an altered state when i was on the dance floor kept myself under control Larry said, to hell with you and your control. I'm going to show you what this music can do to you. I'm going to show you what I can do to you. And Larry had me doing stuff on that dance floor that I was just, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, half of it I can't remember, but my crew would tell you because they told me, man, what were you doing last night? I'm like, hey, you know, talk to Larry because he's the wow. one who, <laughs> when he started spinning that music, he just took wow. you to another place altogether, you know. Who, who took this picture? I don't know. It's been a while. Bill while. Bernstein. I think Bill Bernstein took that picture, and that was at Le Jardin. But I love that photo mm. because what it shows is what I try to explain to people. I've never seen such theatrical dancing like when you went to places like Garage. Never, mm. you know, not like that. Sorry, it didn't exist anywhere else like that. Now, there was other places that were doing it, but not mm-hmm. to that level. No I think what Mikey's talking about, especially, is about 100% release. Yeah. Because most places, I know the commercial joints, you were not allowed to go on the floor. You were not allowed to do any of that stuff. These particular spaces, from what I remember, you were allowed to be 100% emotionally all the way in and you were allowed to do that there was no and there was an unwritten rule which is what i tried to explain let me give a little history i kind of i teach around the world dance you know i've been blessed to do that and the one thing that's common is that from our time there were unwritten rules 
of the dance floor. Just unwritten, you know, like, for instance, back in those days, you really don't smoke really heavily on the dance floor. You don't talk on the dance floor. You don't stand there and just, hey, I want to strike up a conversation on dance floor. You never did that. No way. No, this is why you walked in and you felt that energy. It was intense. Come on. Yep. Yep. It was intense and the lights going crazy. There was no. Come on. That's why it wasn't it wasn't like how some clubs, well, commercial clubs, a person would feel like, well, I'm all the way in by having a drink and standing on the dance floor and talking with the drink. Because that music, there's no way in the way, no way in the world you're not gonna move. And number two, you can't be doing all of that stuff with a drink in your hand. You know? So you can always tell when people were visiting. That we're not <laughs> part of the scene, yeah. Yeah. you know, and that's yeah. another reason why a lot of the dancers said, "Okay, we'll wait till the tourists leave." Right, you know, that didn't get right. their little thing because we know we're in for the long haul. Go ahead, do your thing, you know. So it would empty out like that. We get to a point where we get really comfortable and mm-hmm. spacious, and you can start twirling. Yeah, mm-hmm. yep. yep. To me, I had people that were like, you love. don't even bother to come. Come at 6 a.m. Don't, don't right. I remember, I remember Cedric, Mother Cedric would dance. She would hustle on that dance floor, twirling. Oh, Cedric Paradise Freed. Mm. Oh, yes. May he rest in peace. I watched him twirl on that dance floor. He'd be... Absolutely. And that's another thing. Back in those days, everything from disco up to that time... You did. It's what is what I like to call your dance DNA. Everything that you grew up with, you are allowed to do there. You know, the kids now have a hard time because all of those dances are here. But when we were younger, you had a certain amount of time when hustle was in and everybody learned that. And then there was another phase that phase that came in. A lot of you remember the original bus stops. When that came yeah. in, everybody did that in the 70s. Then after that, at the same time Vogue was happening. I would never have been able to see that if I weren't in spaces like the garage, like tracks. My tracks. You know, oh, your tracks and yeah. like 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 Ice Palace, because there are all of these clubs that were just flamingos. Yeah, flamingos. And the interesting thing was is that because of that garage culture, that lost culture, throughout the week, there was always some place to go for free. Right. <laughs> and we still did that. And still got up the next day or went straight through to the next day to go to work or to school or whatever you had to do. That's right. Because that's just the way it was. You didn't right. miss a beat, right? Yep. 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 Somebody yep. asked a question just a moment ago and said to when when Mikey said about the, the change of the guard, the clearing of the dance floor when Larry wanted to play. What would be a record that he would play that would clear that room out to give everyone who all of you who are dancers to come forward and get comfortable and start stretching out and say, okay, now it's our time. Sometimes you know, thunder. Yeah. I was, I was just going to say, sometimes it's not a record, but more sound effects, you know, he, he, 20 he minutes, take you right? to a peak, take you to a peak, beat you up, make sure you got what you came to get. And then he just put on sound effects for a while. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for those who didn't know better, that say, okay, I guess the DJ's over. We should mm. leave now. And I mean, I for the rest of us, we crickets. knew, we knew. Mm-hmm. That, <laughs> it that was would just be the funny. beginning. For real. If he put on the sound of crickets, he used to have a couple different sound effects, whether it was thunder, a plane, a train, mm-hmm. a train whistle. He would just, you know, hey, come on. Okay. And I Make remember me. when he yeah. would do that, I remember how everybody would look around at each other like, what the? <laughs> <laughs> Some people who knew what was going on when I didn't know what was going on. Like, they yeah, just say, no, no, stay. Just wait. Just wait. Don't exactly. go nowhere. Mm-hmm. David Lozada would say, shh, just, just wait. Watch. David but Lozada, you know, peace. <laughs> having a residency, <laughs> yeah. having a residency was... and being who he was, he could do whatever he wanted. Who's going to tell you? Who's going to say to him, you can't eat? It's his living no, room. He, maybe his you garage was know. his. Now, maybe you guys know. I've always heard this famous story. 
one night he didn't like one particular person that was at the spot. And he had, I don't know if it was the spotlight, he had the track light that was in the booth, follow his cat, turn the music off, and tell him, get the fuck out. Excuse my French, but... Well, they didn't have to say it. What happened was the light was on him. I don't want to mention the person because he's, he's probably watching. The light went on him. <laughs> and, he came, and he was banished for one year. So that was true. Okay. He was yeah. screaming out to the to, to Larry, play some new music. <laughs> See that? Oh, That's everybody doing the dance song. And everybody looked and went, That's <laughs> <you're going."> right. <laughs> he's a famous DJ. <laughs> I Bad remember Bruce. Chase Jones threatened Larry. <laughs> Banished for one year. Larry, you better get that right, or Mama. You up? <laughs> Banished for one year. Oh, no. That is your punishment. You don't mess with Larry. <laughs> when you mentioned thing, Mickey mentioned about the train part. I want to go back to that. The only one room and um, Larry's playing. Get on the funk train. And yes, he did. He did bring in an electric little train set, turned the engine on the little electrical battery operated train set, and put the mic to it. I mean, <laughs> everybody was blown what? away. They were blown what? away. Yeah, he truly brought an electric car train and put the mic to it so it can give it a little sound effect to it. Just get on a funk train in the background. I was like, whoa. Um, there's another thing that's got to be mentioned. Also. <laughs> <laughs> that there's some people maybe a few years older than me that went yeah. to the spot called Reed Street. Yes, we know mm-hmm. about Reed that. Street. Okay. And, 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 and I believe Larry was there and I don't know how the connections happened with him and Mike. I heard and about I, that. Initiated to him to get to this area. Yeah, you know, because, Mike, uh, Mike met Larry on Reed Street and he says, look, I'm going to be opening up a club. I want you to be the DJ. Wow. And and that's how that connection came about. So when when the garage first opened, I mean, Larry knew he was the resident, even though him and Mike had a couple issues for the first few years, um, because, okay. you know, people need to realize that that what the garage evolved into wasn't Michael Brody's initial vision. Now, that's right. I got to tell right. you, I I like the vision that Mike had of building up and growing the garage into what it became. Because, you know, again, back in 77, you had this stripped down version, one room dance floor, Larry off to the side playing music. You really couldn't see him because it was kind of covered up. And from what I heard, it needed to be covered up for some Uh, of the stuff Larry was doing back there. But it was a stripped down one room version. And then they started working on the dance floor that everyone now knows the garage to be and that huge dance floor and the lights and everything else. The sound system was always special. The music was always special. The crew, the garage crew was just superlative in terms of that club was always clean, always mm. well maintained, always well kept always welcoming so you know mike had this vision of starting small and this blowing out the club into what it became with you know the movie room and the roof deck and everything else mm-hmm. oh, the roof deck. But, i got the picture roof deck i got it hang on yeah look at everybody look at this look at this everybody yeah. you go, in the I mean, summer you, you, go you could actually in the summertime go up on the deck you know there were speakers up there which i'm sure the neighbors didn't like and Oof. uh oh, and, yeah. uh yeah. You know, it, it wasn't very loud, but it was loud enough that if you wanted to... You I know, remember bird I mean, barbecuing up there. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it was... The club was <laughs> just so cool. Some family stories getting some barbecue up in there. Okay, go ahead. For real, now. real. For real. Go ahead now. Go get your food. Yeah, so, I mean... So, you know, Brody. Brody's initial vision was a little different, and I think it turned different because of Larry. Larry's no. music just attracted dancers. Mike, I need to ask you a question. Sure. You said something very interesting about Brody met um, Larry at Reed Street and brought him to yeah. the garage. All these years, I thought it was Nikki that introduced 
um, Nikki Siano that introduced um, Larry to Brody for the drugs. I'm not saying this for controversy, guys. No, I no, just no. It, up no, no okay, it may so. have been. It, it, it may have been, but Larry was playing there, and then wait a minute, you know, we before the garage started, Richard there, there was Long, a break in between. That's, that's Richard Long's club, Reed yeah. Street. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so what Richard Long was doing it, with Larry yeah. was he, uh-huh. he created this Reed Street and Larry's playing. So that was Continental Bats. Nick, uh, Joey Montefiglio brings in Larry Levan and then brings in Frankie. Larry leaves there, goes to Reed Street. When Reed Street's right, cooking, right. Michael Brody, like Mikey said, Michael Brody mm-hmm. goes up and says, I want you to be my DJ. I'm going to get this space. From oh, what I understand, David told me, Pino, him and Michael were running around the city looking for spots. So him and David, Michael and David were friends. And they found, I think they found it together and they went and seen it. And I think David said he was one and said, we should something about paradise. What is he going to make this into a paradise? David's very Italian. You know, he just, I remember him saying it that way. And then it just one thing went after oh. another. But the idea was. That was actually the chameleon, that club, the garage. Right. Oh, really? It was a dance was club it? there before the garage, yeah. It was the chameleon. Wait, 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 wait. So you talking about when it was under Fred's parking? That it was right a club? Before, yeah. Right before Fred's Park, it's called the chameleon. There's a, 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 a pyramid with an eye. If you look at some old pictures, everyone... Oh, get you know, It's the chameleon, yeah. okay? How do I know? Richie Candina friend of mine played there as well and Mike Palm and Terry right before uh, Michael Brody then they closed Michael Brody yeah, found yeah. the space I don't know the rest because David DePino remembers they were looking together and they were building the club and Michael would not ha- allow Larry to play anywhere nowhere so what? Larry's waiting for this club yeah because that was the deal oh he shoot wanted to have him ex- like Mikey said Michael wanted him to be his DJ at his club. And I'm so thankful for this conversation because I never would have known. I was under the information throughout all the years that 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 it was Nikki that brought. No, uh, no, 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 no. Nikki didn't bring. No, no, not from my understanding. No. Oh my goodness! So, so, Judy so, Weinstein cleared yeah. that up too. Judy was very Judy close is, with Larry too. She's but, never said that either. Could I oh, say this? Wow. Part? Must have been okay. There. This is, this is the other part that I that I knew of back from going to the loft. And now, back in 76, when I got to the loft, anybody or any part, even Tri-State, Jersey too, you was coming down to Mancusa's place at this point. And even before Nikki opened up the gallery, supposedly, with his brother, they were going to, they were going down to the loft. I remember yes. that. Yeah. Then, yes. I mean, because because there there was a, a little debate with one of the guys that was working at the garage, and and when I had told them that they opened you no, know, they opened Labor Day seventy seven, and the thing was no, they had the lease from the year before that, so it wasn't like seventy seven to eighty seven. Supposedly it was seventy six. I said. I never knew nothing or heard nothing about them having a lease bed. And if they did, I don't remember they but when they used to talk about this pyramid thing and there was parties in there already, I never knew of it. No, because you gotta realize something. This was going on 1973, 74, 75. They already had that space. It was by another Greek guy called Priest. He owned that space. Oh wow! Then the space went quiet, and then I guess it was up on the market. But in those days, there was tons of spots around New York because it wasn't gentrified. Remember, mm-hmm. a lot of those places were old factories, telephone buildings, garages, right. a, gar- a parking right. garage. Right. Think about that. There was no such thing as like it is now. You're going in, and there's residential. Nobody lived around there. I don't. I remember when I went, nobody lived around there. At night, you got off the train, you walked down that block. Yeah, that was a scary thing, though. Thank you, and it was like, whoa! <laughs> no, for real, you're, that was you were downtown, right, Archie? Say it, come on, that man. That was not cute. That was not cute. No. You didn't feel oh, comfortable until you got inside, <laughs> until you got in the club. I remember with David, David saying, "Just be quiet." Be quiet. I mean, how could you guys say it? But at least if you started on Sixth Avenue, if you got King Street on Sixth Avenue, 
you know, it wasn't too bad. That's where it's not too far from where they usually. No, no, Sixth like Avenue is fine. No, we're not talking about Sixth okay. Avenue. Once you come down to Barrett, uh -uh. yeah, uh -uh. that's right. Mm -hmm. Why'd you come down Barrett? Barrett Street? Hey, hey, SOBs is right at the corner of Austin, though. Yeah, Austin, and and here's the kicker: if okay. you drive, don't you dare park your car outside of the garage because you will find people will be sitting on your car <laughs> scratching your hood that's right like it's okay like it's a seat and then when you ask your brother to get off your shit i mean excuse me to get off your car next uh -huh. minute you know you got issues you know hey, i hey, found hey, that out the hard way uh, -uh. uh -huh. yeah hey, it hey, sounds hey, like you're speaking from experience yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, you went through some shit, huh, Archie? Hey, Mickey, when did you first go to the? When did you first go to the garage? Because it was I, I went got to the, the garage Mickey, around 1982. I tell them Labor Day weekend of '77, and I got an invite. I got my invite from David McCusa's law party. It was well, mine was word of mouth because the guy that introduced me to the law, his name is Eric Jeter. I used to work in the movie theater. What year? What year did you go down to the law for the first time, Archie? 1980. 1980. Okay. I just got the you? job working for Center for Provide the Movie Theaters. Huh? Mickey, did, Mick, Mick, did you ever yeah. go to the loft? Mick? Yeah, I, I, was, I was at the loft 76, okay. 77, 78. Uh, you know, I'd go to the loft whenever, whenever Brody was having issues. <laughs> and I started yeah, talking about Brody's vision. Again, Brody did not intend for that club to evolve the way it did. Brody wanted a white gay club. You Larry's know what? music you for saying Larry's this. music. Thank you for saying. Yeah, this. I mean, you but know, wait a minute. Having, what do you having want lived through it, having lived through it, I felt it. Now, I'll also say, my first time there, I felt at home, and I always felt at home. However. I knew Brody well enough to know how he wanted the club to be. And it was supposed to be the meet and greet for white gay men. That's where it was supposed yeah. to be. Yeah. Larry That's came in was. and Larry's music changed everything because Larry brought in the dancers. And didn't matter if you were black, white, pink, green, yellow, didn't matter your orientation. It didn't matter who you were, what you looked like. If you enjoy dancing, you wanted to be there. Mm -hmm. and so Mickey, when, when did Brody see the magic change in order for him not to be too upset about it? Do you know? Well, there was a, um, there was, there was an indifference between him and, and Dennis, the manager. Actually, Dennis, the manager, used to work with him at Poly Something Records. And then when I mentioned it to David, because I asked David, because there was a petition that was set out. That's right. And I remember that. Dupino, we had a conversation prior to this. And I said, David, I don't know if Michael Bro, I mean, Michael Stone had a part to do with it, but I know they had the petition thing going on when they started the new membership and trying to separate the Friday crowd from the core part. And then at that same time, also, Dennis got fired by Mike. Oh. And in my conversation with Dupino on it, he went through some massive change because they were close. They were close. That's when he ended up going into dealing with um, Jelly Bean at the Fun House. But then another spot opened up from another guy that used to go to the gallery by the name of Sunshine that opened up and worked, not opened up, but he worked at a place called the Cuckoo's Nest. Because Cuckoo's oh, Nest came from the bottom. Yeah. bottom. And then I was in contact with Oscar Fuller just to get some history pointers on it. Um, but during that time after the separation and he had fired Dennis, a little bit right after that, they tried to switch my position. And um, I told him, I'm not going to go for manager in, in whatever part. Yeah, I mean, I had a little bit of the imprint of giving some design ideas to the code room and, and, and fairly made, you know, the different rules that I did quite a bit. And I felt I shouldn't go back to another level of just becoming a regular worker. Um, I see, we, I see. we agreed on it. I had a uh, whatever VIP status. Um, when Dennis hooked up with Jelly Bean, um, some people were at the party one night giving out invitations, and um, somebody gave me an invitation. And um, inside the club, Oscar, inside the, club, inside the garage, oh. on the dance floor. 
for, for the for, for the fun. You clarify that you were inside the club when you got an invitation. I'm partying. I'm partying. It's early in the morning. I get an invite, you know, and I don't want to mention the person's name, but <laughs> I get an invite from her, and then they say, "I know, um, Paul Stewart and Joey are telling me that Michael wants to talk to me." Talk so to I'm you. Like, I go to Mike Brody's office. He says, "Oscar, what you got in your pockets or anything?" I says. I got this. I got a flyer. Like you stole something. Like you stole something. I got the flyer, and the flyer was given to me, and I took it from one somebody that I know. He says, but, you know, you know, you know, Dennis is out, and blah, blah, blah. blah. I says, yeah, and, well, what was you doing? Was she handing out the flyer? I says, yo. I says, yo, Mike, I've been dancing. Somebody handed me the flyer. I took it. He says, well, we're, we're, we're going to have to ask you to leave the club. I said, huh? what are you talking about? Um, yeah, because if you're going to be doing anything with Dennis or anything like that, you know, oh, you guilty by association. You, need to go. you, yeah. So, um, you're like cancer now here. Well, 86 back then. I got 86 from the, you got the 86, right? Now, wait, yeah. hang on. So let's, right. This is the politics. Now. I'm going to go to Mikey now. Mikey, let me give everyone an explanation what you were saying. The garage opens. With the sound system being delivered, okay, and outside was the first night of this invitation that they sent out, and it was all white, gay crowd, okay, and Larry's in there with Richard Long and ever the staff in there trying to get the system up and running, and the system was brought in late because of a snowstorm. Those white queens that later went on to go to the Saint Ice Palace and those right, clubs, right. Ice Palace 57, Fire Island, The Pines. It's that same crew. So everybody has to understand, Michael Brody and Mel Sharon, owner of West End, partied heavily in Fire Island. Okay? Mm -hmm. So their dream was to bring that whole feeling into New York City. That same type mm -hmm. of thing that Flamingos was doing. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. Flamingo was more the white gay, upper class, you know, crowd that yep. they wanted to have. Yep. But here's the yep. problem. They had a gospel funky ass DJ that did not play that way. He could play if he wanted to, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. He liked mm -hmm. music that had huge vocals and he came from the same school of Mancuso, Ciano, Frankie Knuckles. Went to my high school, Erasmus Hall. It's Erasmus yep. Hall High School. Yep. So now, <laughs> now, here's the thing, everyone. This is the tricky part now. Larry Levan gets fired. Oh. They start to use DJs with this idea, or I should say fired. Maybe yeah. they just said to him, sit on the sideline for a minute. We're going to try something. So I hear they bring Jim Burgess in. They bring Roy Thoden. They bring Sharon White in. They bring in... I don't remember who else. There's a few others that they brought in and people are going to say to me, how could you forget? Richard Tucker may remember, but because he was at the Saint, he mm -hmm. may remember. Um, how long did this last, Mikey? This moment of trying to bring it out. Up? Try it out. Take a chance. You can do it. Try it out. Da, 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 da. How long did this last? I'd say... I'd say like this. Go ahead, Mick. I was, I was, I was going to say it, it was it was six to twelve months. That's oh, long, right? right? Yeah. Wow. It, I mean, wow. Larry played in between, but there were always these guest DJs, and you would show up, and it's like, who's on the turntables? I mean, you 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 <laughs> felt the difference. You know, they tried they tried their best, but you felt the difference. Uh -huh. I, I'm gonna put my hands up. I'm gonna put my hands up. Who's on the turntables? Who's on the turntables? Who's on the turntables? <laughs> this is to everybody that's listening, okay? <laughs> and, and, and at this time, oh, I really didn't hang out in the booth. But Archie, they, they, Archie, they, <laughs> you've been there, Archie. <laughs> All right? yeah, he, Archie's crying on that one, right? <laughs> Archie, Archie, are you trying to say that they did a cleanup? <laughs> well, kind of like in that right. Hey, Nunny, Nunny, Nunny. I'm going to call it for what it out is. Out it's real, it's real. It's real. It's real. It's real. They windex the place. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, at that time, when they, they, they opened up to the guest DJ thing, and I think it was a great thing that they, they, they came up with that idea because they, during, after, the, somewhere around the construction time, 
And obviously the movement didn't go the way Mike intended to. They had to do something financially for all this money that they put out. And besides them yeah. having the separation of the membership cards, the guest DJ part, and I tell people, and even he might have blew out, I don't know, one speak or whatever it was, but T. Scott, hands up to the brother. And let's you go know? to T. Scott. Here we go. Wait, wait, let's go. T. Scott. Yeah, the T. Scott's T. home yeah, right yeah. there. Right. So let me from there. He, when he went into that booth, and, you know, I'm not going to say that people get, you know, you can tell when a person enlightened you on your own system and took it to another level. And T did that. Now, Joey told me that night costed them a lot of money and Michael Brody was angry. Not because he blew a speak out, but he opened up that system. Not so much like Larry had did at that one point. But yeah, Larry did come back after that in a whole different polished way. I hang on, say. hang on, everybody. Let's let's clarify another thing about New York loyalty with New York DJs. So if you had a guest come and play and Larry went to Israel or wherever he went to go do what he did, they put what I call the gates on the system. The system would cry when somebody else played. It was out, it was like, why does it sound so screwed up? There's a reason to why it sounds screwed up. Because Larry LeVan was not going to have anybody else play in his home and make sure he, you're going to turn him out. So he had to come home and deal with it. That was something that I always remembered saying, God, this is your home. Wouldn't you want to share to let somebody else come and rock it? Hell no! Hell no! You want nobody going in your fridge. You said you want nobody going in your fridge, drinking your Kool Aid. No, uh, uh-uh. uh. Okay. Uh-uh. I mean, like I said, even though T blew out the speaker, I mean, speaker. Talk, no, I, Oscar, speaker, yeah. speaker. That yeah, was about six, yeah, about six thousand dollars in damage after that weekend. Okay, okay. I mean, I, you know, at least he tried. Joey to... said, Joey said they had to call Richard Longin. Oh, Michael Bodie was screwing. Wow, <laughs> I never forget him telling he that. Did. Story. Listen, I mean, but he did what he came to do. Robot. He came to do what he, he came to do. He still yeah. turned out a nice party. He turned out a, a fantastic party. You know, so I mean, with with. Uh, and that's about 81 already going into 82. So that's myself, after, after Mike has started 19, coming 1980. Back, Look at the lineup in 1980 that we would have had there. And the different parties, I had already stopped going. Like by well, got, look at that, look at that lineup. I mean, look at that. Wow. Yep. You imagine going to uh, now to a party with that kind of lineup? I mean, that level of lineup? Mm. Couldn't afford what? it. Couldn't afford Lenny, to do it. Lenny. Look at the prices. Look at the price down below on the left hand side. Yes. Members, ten dollars. Guess eleven. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For all that, I mean, you know, you gotta take your hands off to Brody, because as much as he needed money and he made a lot of money from the garage, I'm he sure he did not, you know, overdo it. He he, he really didn't. Uh-huh. Well, he had as you mentioned about the money part too, Mickey, um, Mel Sherman had a big part to do with that. Mel Sherman oh, really? helped him out quite a bit also, you know? And and, wow. and that was, through, as you say, through behind, behind the back doors, but Mel did contribute quite a bit to him at the time, you know. Yeah, but Diane Shafasi told yeah. me that Michael paid back that money, that initial, I think it was 60 grand he loaned him to get that mm. money. That's okay, well, a you lot got, of money. Yo, that's a lot of money in 1977. Okay. For somebody to loan you sixty grand? Yeah, but they were lifelong friends too. They're like, yeah, yeah. Well, he, wow. you know, I, I mean, lots of people can say a lot of things, but the garage was Brody's vision. Yeah, you know, Mel was there. He helped him. He did a lot, but the garage was Brody's vision, and he put it together. So I got to give him credit where it's where it's due. Because were it not for him, it would not have turned into what it did. Were it not for him, Larry wouldn't have grown into who he was. I mean, because having that sound system, having that dance floor, I mean, you know what it's like dancing on that dance floor. You could dance for 12, 15 hours and and Mm -hmm. not feel it. All you're feeling is the joy of dancing. That That dance floor was specially constructed for Uh dancing. The dance dance floor, I got to put this in on your guys. 
this was only one of the dance floors that was constructed in that way when they actually had sand in the bottom of this dance floor. Right. When and they why? Why did they have sand, Oscar? Why? Yes, they did. They, they, the reason why they put the sand underneath this wood and everything else, so it can observe the bounce of all these people that were there. Don't forget, you're talking over 2,000 square feet. And when they first had the construction party opening up, there wasn't no stage at first. You had wall to wall. Wow. And in one of the photos, you can see it. It's wall to wall. The stage wasn't even up then. You know, but the point was the floor hats off, bro. Me and my friends, when we got there, they used to buff the floor every night before you came down there to party. Yep. Buffing the I'm floor. Telling buffing you. The so we was able to run and slide like we was ice skating on this floor. Oh, I remember that. Party, man. Yeah. So, you know, like, like, like. And the cleanest, up. and the cleanest mirror balls, too. Don't forget. Yeah, I mean, but like, that Nick club was, was well maintained. That whole staff, that whole garage staff, cleaning crew. I mean, you know, Kenny Eubanks in the kitchen. Oh, was, wow. Yeah, Kenny. Yeah, Kenny. You know. Oh, man. Yeah. And, you had to talk you know, about Kenny. You know, wow. it was, Kenny took it was, care of us. One of the only dance floors that were created like that, that I know of. Right. You know, so when 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 you mentioned Mike Brody and the whole the whole idea of it, so what I tell people when I'm more, I'm I'm traveling and they mention to me about the ground, I tell them it became like a playground. It it became mm -hmm. an experimental playground, sound wise, constructive part when they went to the construction part of building this, and and and, and now when West End Records started happening, you used to have the week parties for the record pool and also for West End Records. So mm. some of these, the first time I heard Karen Young singing Hot Shot, I didn't know who she was. When she got there and see who she was, I was in shock. You know, having all this I was stuff. there for that. I was like, there. I summer of 78. Like, oh like, summer of 78. Was, you know, she, she, gets, she gets up there on stage. I'm like, who is this? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> So the week party day too, you know, for the record business. So it became to me. I tell people, if listen, Patrick, what's the guy, the designer, the designer that passed, Patrick, Patrick Kelly. Trump. Yeah. So listen, my hands are standing up right now. If you had anything to do with the arts, not just dancing, not just DJing, anything with Andy Warhol. I mean, you go on down the yeah, list. Don't anything forget. Don't forget. Larry Levan yeah. loves Stephen Burrows because I remember Nikki telling me that he loves Stephen Burrows. He loved the way they design clothes, and that's what Larry and Frankie went to go do. Okay. They were going to be designers, so I'm not shocked to hear that all these uptown designers were all around them, because that's yeah. what they, that's what that was they were doing. They were all yeah, into right. that. He would be yeah. wearing crazy fashion stuff at times. Yep, mm -hmm. crazy. But wow. yet he dressed no dress. He mean bare ass naked up in that booth. You know, it depends on what <laughs> yeah. you have. <laughs> yeah. Hey yo, Man, that place was hot. So yeah. That place was That's hot. Right. No, so you, you had to strip down. You no, had to strip it, down. We say that I always dream, you know, because when we did the Fire Island trips, you know, for me back then and still to now, the best way to swim is in the nude. But the point was, I always had this fantasy: oh, the garage is doing all these parties. Why don't they just have a nude party one night? Oh, oh, so. <laughs> Yeah, I went there. Uh -oh. I mean, because you basically almost dance but naked sometimes. And some ladies sometimes would be topless. So why not? I mean, what took place behind the speakers or, or in the toilets? I mean, you could go on down the list what took place. You know, so why not? I mean, we're going to Fire Island. Baby. And even my brother and his wife is telling me, I said, yo, basically yeah. most of the people are new where we're going to. Oh, well, I said, yo, I mean, you know. Well, that would be a, too tempting. Can you imagine? Yo, can you listen, imagine? listen. Actually, can I can't. You know, wait, can you, you imagine? I, I, you know, I never asked Michael should he do it, but I was always one of my fantasies. Yo, they should just have a new party, man. And you know what happened? Records like, don't that stop, keep on. Eventually, if that would have happened, that club would have gotten closed. You know That's that would right. Happen. That's right. That's, That's what right. made the club keep going because here's a crazy part. Frankie Crocker, this is how I know about Paradise Garage, because listen to Frankie Crocker in 1978-79 talking about his escapades of going to this hot club called Paradise Garage. Oh. Right. You Check this out. He, he lived that out on BLS? 
Oh, sure he did. He would tell you. Say, I went to the Paradise Garage <laughs> at the Five Park Drive Time Show. He, I'm going to be there tomorrow night. Larry LeVan, blah, blah, blah. When he would talk about a lot of clubs in New York that he was, you know, because he was a celebrity in a sense. Could you imagine today how many people want that kind of social media recognition? You imagine Michael Brody calling WBS telling Frankie Crockett, stop talking about my club. Right. Oh, I don't wow. want you to talk right. about my club at all. Right. Right. People seem to be like, what? She did. I know that because Diane, again, Diane Shafasi told me, Michael yeah. called up and said, Frankie, if you keep talking about my club, I'm not letting you in anymore. Oh, Frankie get 86. Ooh. And Frankie, you get 86 eventually <laughs> from the rock. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He did get 86. Ooh. He crossed habitual Chop. line stepping. As they say, habitual line. You you went over the line? Chop. 86. He's gone to... Mm, mm, mm. So, how, could Later you on, you have to tell me where that term actually comes from. Because I... I know. I'm really crazy hey, about was, about codes. Hey, how can I say? I don't know. I mean, I don't. I don't want to say the club scene, but I know it was going around. You know, like when you when when it, you you know you got blocked off for coming into a place, but I know exactly where it comes from. Yeah, and then I know. In the place, so if, if any of you ever find out, let me know because I'm. Yo, I'm everybody, crazy about remember it. remember this term, everybody in like Flint. That's right. Mm. That's I right. see all like the Flint. time back then. You're in like Flint, baby. In like oh. Flint. You know what? Now, <laughs> do you remember Mickey? You well, okay. There's a Halloween party going on, supposedly. Or was it an April's Fool thing when they did the entrance from the other side of the club? Yeah, they, they said, um that was uh, that was uh, April Fool's. I think it was eighty or eighty one. Brody sends out this invite. I've still got it, but it's in my basement crawl space. He sends out an invite saying, "There's a new club opening up. Name of the club was called Taxi, and that was the whole design that they sent out. And what they did was they used the address on Charlton Street." <laughs> <laughs> and you oh, wow. showed up, yeah. and then you yeah. realize it was just the other the entrance back, to the, the back garage, the garage. On the back yeah. side of the garage. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, That's brilliant. yeah. You know, brilliant. um, so so I kept a lot of the invites because once I got out of school, my job moved me around a lot, and whenever I would get an invite to one of these parties, it kind of kept me connected to what was going on. So. You know, I've got a stash that, that I bring out every so often. Um, but they, you know, they were really precious to me. And that's how I kept my wrench and kept my my memberships that I renewed up until the club closed, even though I really didn't go much after 84, 85 time frame. Watch, is that your um, car there that they're sitting on? Oh, no. Mm -mm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. well, that was notorious. That 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 whole block was notorious. <laughs> Archie, you know? how come you didn't park in the parking lot down at the end of um, King and what is it Hudson? Yeah, down there's there. a parking Back lot. Back in those days, there. I just got my car. Like like I think eighty two, eighty two. Okay. Yeah, I think I just got my car eighty two, and you know the whole thing. I think for me was not being. Well, I was lazy. You know, I just wanted to just okay. pull up and put my thing and just go. <laughs> and the reason why I stopped doing that, when I went to Zanzibar, I did that. And my car was destroyed. Uh, okay. Okay. So I, I didn't do that yeah. anymore after that, you know, naturally. But right. if it's on that block or across the street. Yeah. Let's, go, look at the, let's look at the block. Oh, yeah. Look at the block. Look at everybody sitting on top of the car. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So steal that picture for one minute. Okay, so the lady with the red bag, the one with the white dress, the wallet. That's Denise with the that's white Denise? dress. That's Denise? And that's Mary. Yes, that's Denise. Oh, and shoot. when I met them yep. first was at the gallery. Okay, for they were originally from Staten Island. Now I want to get the guy with his hand up behind the girl with the white on and the afro. Yep. That's Brother Stanley. And I still Forgive me, guys. I got to plug in the computer. It's about to die. Right. He's in the middle of the dance floor 
and the flexibility of him taking his leg and putting it, you know, when you can put, not too many people have that flexibility on their body, where you can take that leg arch and put it behind your back of your neck, like in that yoga move, Stanley was an outstanding dancer, man, back in the days. And quite a few of them that are there. I can't remember the rest of the names. But Stanley, his with his hand up, oh, man, great dancer. Great that And Denise and her sister, obviously, too, man. You know, so. You used to speak to them? Yeah, I stay in contact with Denise. She's wow. in Denise yeah, is still She's in Florida these days. Her sister still lives in Staten Island. And something about they got a little piece of property. So she comes back and forth sometimes you know, to visit in, the, in New York, but we stay in contact. We stay in regular contact. I met her back in the gallery days. You were talking about like 76, 77. There's yeah. only, a, you know what, in the sands of time, it's like yesterday, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. So some but, people are asking me about, about, about Zuki, Larry's baby, the sound system. What you all know about sound? Because we know about light. Was light first in the club or was it the room built and sound comes in? Which way did it go? They were doing it. Okay. At this time, they had a couple of electricians, but the other guy that really was his helping hand was a guy by the name of MG. Oh, yeah. And MG, proper electrician, you know, with the Union DC 37 and the whole bit, but he had a big part of the first lights going up and whatever Larry was trying to lay out. And I forgot who else was there. But so MG would get his And then Larry would get on the ladder, you know, and the hop, skip, and the jump. He would do that every almost every night you came into the club. Like when we was there, we had to get there about an hour ahead. And, you know, even though it was something that maybe MG could handle, Larry would go up on the ladder himself and do stuff. You know, but uh, MG was his helping hand when they were this is like going under the construction party part where the lights and sound was already being played with already. I mean, you know, between him and Richard, they they were there during the week, man. These guys, I don't even think they slept much, man. You know, because with their combination, it was like a, it was like a playground for them. You know, let's bring this in. Let's try this. They throw oh, this move in here. This, you know, so I don't I don't know how much sleep these guys got at that time. I so really uh, from what I remember, in 81, the round lights went in, the round circle lights go in. OK, but I know pre I didn't get there yet. Pre to that, you know, what I'm mm. saying like, they said it was like very yeah. minimal, the lighting at that point. I mean, Mikey may remember better than anybody and Oscar, you too. Yeah, um, I mean, I got, I got I got something around here somewhere. Uh oh, <laughs> digging the trick bag. This, this, this is all over here, man. I mean, so I, I'm trying to see. If I got the one, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, um, this is the one with the lighting thing going on. Let me get you to that. Yeah, so those are still around lights coming up on here. Because this is, if you see this one, I don't know if you can see it much that good. That's around, that, yeah, yeah, I see this. Yeah, yeah. You know, so the lights were already round up on there. Mm -hmm. You know? So yeah, actually does. on that, so the round lights that we're seeing, that stage lighting was up already, right? Yeah, but then now this is a this is okay. This is now now with the now with the round lightings, this is like right after the construction. It, it was again the stage was in that light. You see the lights that I'm showing here, the cans, look at all the cans. Right, yeah. right. Now, if you pop me back on, I'm going to show you what it was before the round lights came in. Okay, go ahead. You see, you see the straight lighting. Let's let's go to you. Oh yeah, I remember the straight. Yep. Hey, okay, guys. and then it had the boards up there on the ceiling. I guess for whatever sound effect. So they That's they were always experimenting with stuff. But this is like this is in '79. So this is just before they constructed to get other lighting set up. You know. <laughs> And they wasn't at, at the bottom part here. You can see with, behind her. How clean the floor is in the picture. Wow. Pillow, yeah. Pillow to yeah. your left is where the entrance is at. And right above is Larry's booth. But that's the wall to wall without the stage being down on the floor. Then There wow. wasn't no stage at this point. You know, so. And to yeah. me, you know, what, what, what Oscar has there is, is the beauty of the garage in terms of how it was built up and how it evolved over the years, because they just kept 
doing stuff. There was no, you know, uh, uh, one size fits all. It kept developing, you know, yes, whether, it whether it was Larry and the sound system or Larry and the lighting system and whomever else was working on the lighting system. They just kept working on it. So, I mean, the, 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 the club was like a living, feeling being. And we lived and we, we felt it. Um, uh, it. It was such a wonderful experience being there. Um, consider myself so fortunate to have, to have lived through it. Um, there, there's That's just great. nothing else like it because it, it, it changed my life. I mean, again, when I... When I mentioned how at home I felt the first time and every time I walked in there, um, to me, and, and, and I think everyone here can appreciate it because you, you said a couple of things about New York in the 70s and 80s and the life we lived back then. Going dancing was cathartic. I mean, it was such a release. You needed to have some place to go mm-hmm. and just dance your ass off all night long. And that's what the garage provided for us. Whether it was the garage or the loft or the other places mm-hmm. that people went to, you just needed some place to go and just get it out your system. Mm-hmm. And uh, to me, the garage was the best place for that. And again, uh, <laughs> he's right because New York was New York was uh, different. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, in those yeah. days, it it yeah. was a lot of us came from different places and different experiences and New York is not like the New York they got now. <laughs> no, 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 no. You know. I oh, mean the Walt all. Disney World version and Warner Brothers version? <laughs> <laughs> uh, A lot of people don't know that. They la, don't la, know that. La, 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 la. Audience out there, back in those days in 72, 70 to maybe 74, our local 42nd Street was not the way it looked like now. Yeah. No, 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 no. Oh, yeah. You could go to the movie theater and see Kung Fu flicks, five, no, actually three Kung Fu flicks in the movie for five bucks. And you'd be in there all night long. Sometimes you'd, you'd uh, you know, sneak into the movie theaters and things of that sort. New York was totally different, totally different. So what Mikey's talking about, release, it's essential. It was necessary. And that's what we had to do. We had to do it. It was either like Grace Jones says, you either got to do or die. That's just how it was. Yeah. yeah. And there's a song for everything. Everything. <laughs> so true. Everything. Thank you for that, Oscar. Because there's a song for every situation on earth. Every situation. Welcome, my brother. Yeah. So, so, so Lenny. Um, when did you first go there? Because, you know, you've got that recording of the first anniversary back in 79, but that was prior to you even going there. So so help yeah. me understand well, your attraction to the garage that you recorded that show off of uh, BLS. Frankie used to do his drive time at five o'clock. So he was on every day and my mom and dad have the radio on and I was a big BLS listener. And I think at the same time, Disco 92 was happening. Right. So, but I liked the way Frankie programmed the music on BLS. It was more R&B-ish, more in, in that sound. So what was happening was, which I later found out, Frankie would go to Studio 54, all the clubs in New York, I guess because of his stardom as a radio DJ. Mm -hmm. And he would then explain through the show, kind of like Howard Stern, how he speaks his mind. But Frankie was doing it on a five o'clock time. He was talking about that he was going to a disco club. And particularly with that recording that I made, he mentioned that he was going to have which was Friday night, this was. He was talking about that Saturday. It was in January. He says, I'm going to celebrate the second anniversary of the garage. I didn't know what the garage was. And it's going to be a disco. And they used to say it like this, nonstop party. So no commercials, disco nonstop. Mom, dad, do me a favor. Can we, you know, record this? Because I love this. My father had a a reel-to-reel, recorded it. And I had the tape. The tape was played. 
many years in my mother's house. Parties because it had Rough Diamond on. It had a lot of big records that he played that were also maybe pre-hit hit records. They were just becoming as what a DJ would normally do. He would play new music and mix it with stuff that he played. Like, for example, he plays the Jacksons record in there. I am love. What am I going to do? I never heard that on any white station. That was only on a BLS style record. You know, that was, you know, and I felt it was super cool, BLS, super cool. And long later on, I find out Frankie Crocker's in that DJ booth watching Larry LeVan, seeing what he was doing. So what was happening was Larry be playing a hot record. Frankie probably with his entourage and do with just anything <laughs> go like that and go tomorrow play the record. A lot of times records were played on the weekend and on Monday.